À chaque élection, on nous dit que les At every election, we're told that uh, young people are apathetic. But is it true? Panel, associate editor and parliamentary reporter for Maclean's Merrick magazine, Aaron Wary. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, as uh, I'm a few months short of my 36th birthday, I'm basically almost too old for this panel. Um, and uh, after seven years of covering Parliament, I'm mostly dead inside. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to talk as little as possible uh, and sort of let the uh, experts uh, lead, us, lead the discussion. Uh, just to introduce our panelists, though, we have uh, David McGrain, as a political science scientist at the University of Saskatchewan. He's currently the principal investigator of the Canadian Social Democracy Study, and he is uh, writing a book on the federal NDP from 2000 to 2015. His latest book, Remain Loyal, Social Democracy in Quebec and Canada, has been shortlisted for a Saskatchewan Book Award for scholarly writing. <laughs> This past fall, Uzma Malik was uh, elected as a trustee to Canada's largest Woo! school board, the Toronto District School Board. Got some fans there, sister. Applause before I even finish the intro. For her downtown community of TDS, TDS, TDSB Ward 10, Trinity Spadina, Ozma has uh, worked as a lead education policy analyst at Ontario's provincial legislature and as director of campaigns and community outreach at the Stephen Lewis Foundation and served on the board of the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Shad is a Juno-winning uh, Polaris-nominated rapper and radio broadcaster. Uh, originally from London, Ontario, uh, earlier this month he was named the host of uh, a, a small radio program called Q. <laughs> Last but not least, joining us uh, all the way from Brussels is David Kitching, a policy advisor and uh, found it at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, a think tank at the crossroads between social democracy and the European project that serves the needs of socialist, social democratic, and labor parties in Europe and beyond. Yeah. So David, uh, you uh, conducted the study that sort of is the uh, focus for this discussion. Uh, maybe to lead us off, you could kind of walk us through what you learned about uh, millennials. Yeah, I guess I did a bit of statistics, and uh, I guess statistics are uh, not as popular as rap. It seems like rap's pretty popular. Um, so, it's okay. <laughs> used to that. I'm a professor, right? So, uh, uh, so anyway, I, I, we, uh, I just want to thank the Broadman Institute for, uh, you know, for publishing the, uh, the study that I did. Uh, we had a pretty ambitious project, myself and 14 other political scientists. Uh, we decided to do a post-election survey, so like a poll, after each provincial election from 2011, all up until 2014, so it made for a pretty big data set of around 8,000 uh, uh, Canadians. And, uh, and, and it, this is actually the first study that's really came out of the entire data set, so it's nice to see the Broadman Institute being really on the cutting edge of academic research. And um, I, what we did basically, what I was interested in, there's a quite a bit of literature around kind of non-voting or why millennials or young people do not vote. Uh, and I was somewhat interested in that, but I wanted more to push into what are the political attitudes of young people. Uh, particularly, uh, are they right, are they left, how progressive are they? Uh, and so what I did is I, uh, I broke up the sample into uh, two groups. Uh, there, the first group was uh, people that were under 35, which uh, there's a debate whether that's a millennial or not. Probably not. That's kind of a combination of sort of millennials and Generation X. And then people over 35 were considered older Canadians in the, uh, in the sample. And, and, I, and I remember when I was doing the sample, it pained me a little bit because I'm actually 37. So, uh, yeah, so I, I'm officially now enshrined in my academic research as being old. So that was a bit of a, that was a, bit of a, a, a shocker for me. But, uh, but, but nonetheless, um, the main message that really came out of that, uh, of, that of the study was that, basically speaking, uh, 
Canadians are broadly progressive. I think that's good news for the progressive movement and the people here in this room. Uh, for instance, 60% of Canadians uh, want uh, to have higher corporate taxes, for instance, right? Um, a, a significant amount of Canadians, over 70%, want to have a better standard of living. Uh, well over 50 or 55% want to have a more activist government that creates jobs. And so as I went through it, I saw, it, I saw a number of trends, how Canadians are basically, basically I would say, uh, progressive. Uh, but every time I looked at it, younger Canadians were always more progressive than older Canadians. And that was really the message of it. And even as I drilled down even further, because it was such a large data set, I was able to look at, OK, how about young males versus young females, or non-religious young people versus religious young people. And, and no matter what the social demographic group, this really surprised me, no matter almost what the social demographic group was, these young people, the people under 35, had more progressive values than older people in that group. So the, the message I think that's coming out here is that this is a particular uh, opportunity for political parties in the next federal election. And indeed, uh, if they do uh, appeal and inspire young people to get out and vote, uh, we're going to have a radically different looking Canada after the next federal election. And, uh, and just, to, and one, just one last thing, uh, just to finish off, because I didn't want to make it seem like I got the applause now, so I didn't want to make it seem like it's, uh, too, it was all kind of smooth sailing. I think there were a couple of rough spots. Uh, I think when we asked, uh, and made some nuanced findings, when we asked young people uh, about uh, the existence of patriarchy, uh, you know, whether men and women have actually increased, have actually got uh, met equality, uh, young people actually kind of said they weren't all that feminist. They kind of said, you know, yes, we, 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 have, uh, we have equality between men and women. Young people didn't, weren't that great at recognizing discrimination either against Aboriginal people uh, compared to older people or against, uh, or, or against uh, uh, visible minorities. And finally, actually, they didn't want to spend much on social assistance, uh, and that was much like older Canadians. So it's not all smooth sailing, but definitely there's some opportunities there. So I'll end it there. As my having actually run and, and, and won office, are there, are there things you have learned uh, both about millennials and about the political process and how they sort of interact with each other? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked, Erin. <laughs> um, I, I also want to start by saying it's a, it's a real honor to be here and to be on this panel and with some of my, my heroes as well, so it's pretty, pretty cool. And I think, you know, as I've been... Um, as I've been part of the conversations over this past weekend, you know, what we're talking about on this panel has been a big question for all of us, right? About how do we engage the under 35, the young people, the millennials, uh, into not just taking political action, but, you know, a progressive approach to that work. And, um, you know, I have, to, I have to say it feels a little weird to be up here and to be referred to as a millennial, so I'm kind of relieved that you were very generous with that, uh, with that demographic. Um, I do feel like I'm at, at the crossroads of generations. I can kind of empathize, sympathize with the plight of millennials, uh, those I, I don't always see myself as one. Um, my parents immigrated from Pakistan to Canada more than 40 years ago. Um, you know, what was really important in the household that I grew up in was participation, um, taking community action for social justice wherever you saw that, and however small uh, but meaningful. Uh, my political identity, my act, um, you know, was, um, was shaped through action and organizing, mostly in the student movement. That was very formative for me. And uh, my experience continued to grow as I worked at the provincial legislature. I worked for the Ontario NDP on education issues, education policy and outreach. Um, and I worked on countless different political campaigns for some really incredible elected representatives and politicians, as well as in labor organizing and building uh, movements in the nonprofit world more recently. Um, education has always been my passion, and that's in policy and capacity building, and also I think in this sincere belief that we don't have a lot of places where, uh, that are equalizers in this world, but I really do think public education is still one of those, and that we really have to be champions and make investments in that. Um, <laughs> so, 
So as you know, I ran, uh, I ran for trustee in the Toronto District School Board in my downtown community of Trinity Spadina, which I love. Um, and in October, I, I also won. Uh, my message, uh, my, thank you. <laughs> the message in my campaign was really clear from the very beginning. It was to provide the kind of leadership uh, that gave every student in, in Toronto the opportunity to thrive and succeed. And that was really my driving force. Um, and along the way, I was targeted for who I was. Um, for the work that I'd done on human rights and equity issues. And it was a surprisingly vicious and well-coordinated and well-resourced uh, campaign of hate, lies, and innuendo, and actual intimidation as well. Um, my belonging was called into question, and my colleagues and my supporters were attacked for, for standing with me as well. Um, but I'm happy to say that in the end, we really kicked butt, and we succeeded, and it's because we came together. And I think for me, that October election really clarified a lot of things. It made me aware of the challenges that we progressives still face. Um, not that we necessarily need a reminder, but sometimes there are moments that crystallize some of those challenges. Um, especially, you know, the challenge of forging a movement and a common mission for real profound social change. And it also made me aware of the work that still remains about staying current and relevant and connected. It also gave me really sincere hope uh, and reminded me that community isn't a buzzword in, in my experience and grassroots is definitely not a cliche that we need to distance ourselves from. And so this, uh, this next part is for my fellow millennials, you know, the BuzzFeed generation. Um, I made a list, right, um, uh, that, you know, like that. Um, and these are actually, you know, kind of three lessons that I have learned from like the front lines of millennial political organizing. So the first big lesson, and I think that we kind of share it in experience as well, is that a tool is not a strategy, but it definitely helps. Um, you know, as millennials, and I think all of us, we also all fall into this category, are really connected, right? Whether it's Facebook or Insta Instagram or Twitter, or as I visit schools, every kid's on Snapchat, you know, for better or worse. Um, and it's a part of our culture. It's actually not a choice, but it is a social necessity. If you're not there, you pra you're practically invisible. And social media is often spoke of as a strategy, and we all know that it's definitely not. It's a tool that is activated by the strategies that we employ. And you know, when the attacks came uh, really hard, especially on social media um, against me to kind of undermine and intimidate my campaign, those folks who were driving that were enthused and motivated by that sort of uh, attack and, and the, the room that social media gave them to be able to do that. And you know, to put all their efforts into derailing what we were trying to achieve. I also learned in this campaign where trolls live. They live on Twitter and Reddit, just in case you were interested in knowing. Um, and what the response was was really incredible. My supporters also took to social media, not to take on those, those haters point by point, but to drown out the message with a positive counter. And as an example, I love to tell the, the online campaign that a really great group in Toronto, Women in Toronto Politics, employed. It was, uh, it was a, you know, a campaign with the hashtag City I Want, and it was an opportunity to support myself and a number of other racialized women candidates who had experienced an unparalleled um, level of prejudice in the, in the municipal campaign. And, uh, and it really did capture the imagination of our supporters, right? Not just saying what was wrong about what was happening, but what is the kind of city that we want to see and the kind that we want to get behind. And our collective response wasn't just effective because it was planned and coordinated, which it was, to try and counter likewise, but because it also came from the heart. And I don't think we can underestimate as progressives that we do have a tremendous amount of heart, and it's something that when we lever leverage and we mobilize, it can be a really powerful thing. And that heart comes from having done the work to build relationships and communities, IRL, in real life, um, you know, being in communities and being part of communities for a very long time. It's beyond mere engagement. It is talking about politics as a part of life. To be political, in my experience and as a progressive, is to care about where we are and who lives with us and what's happening around us and what's happening down the street in our neighborhoods. And it's not just about focusing on what's happening in Ottawa or what's happening in Queen's Park as something that's distant from our experience. 
And so these tools give us a really unprecedented opportunity to tell our stories, and they also allow us to call out systemic forms of discrimination and inequality in practice, right? Theoretically, we might be able to ask young people, you know, do you believe in patriarchy or white privilege or gender inequality? But, you know, hashtags like Black Lives Matter, I don't know more, yes all women, you know, PM dress code, all of these are actually calling out systemic forms of racism in a way that is really profound and powerful and their effectiveness is backed up by the organizing that we have to be doing on the ground. And that brings me to my, to my next lesson, lesson number two, which is nothing beats knocking on doors and it is really, really hard. <laughs> um, it's what every organizer and activist and campaigner knows, is that there is absolutely no replacement for that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, you know, forget the distinction between online and offline. They should flow together and flow around each other and be a part of, uh, of what we're doing. But if we're just focused on the offline, then we've already kind of, of lost the big picture. Uh, nothing for me could replace the six plus months of canvassing, conversing, talking, listening, organizing, and meeting that I, uh, that I did. And I really, I'm really confident about that. Nothing could have, could have um, made the difference that, that that actually did. And we know from, from research and from you know, some of our own experiences as well that millennials are natural activists. That was something that, was really, uh, that really jumped out to me in the research that came out was you know, to go to a protest, sign a petition, take an action. Millennials uh, that fall into that category are more likely to do that maybe than, than their older counterparts. Um, but how do we move them to being agitators, to, to go, take, go from you know, clicktivism to actually knocking on doors and being on the ground as part of that movement. And that's where, you know, opportunities like this are really crucial. Uh, we need to build the capacity and organize. It's really vital. And we also need to be adapting our models to meet the moment. We have to be, you know, focused on what our goal is, but flexible and nimble and meeting people where, where they actually are. And that means, you know, recruiting, enthusing, exciting people about what our message is. You know, what was really amazing to see was when, uh, you know, the hate campaign slowly began and the response was also slow to build. But when, when it did happen, it was really awesome and it really galvanized people who I never even expected to be a part of this campaign or to feel passionately about what was happening. And it's not automatic. People didn't automatically just make that connection. It does take that work. But when people jump to action, it really can be amazing. And I think the, the real big question for us as progressives and as organizers is how do we continue to do that in a consistent way and not just around the biggest issues and not just around when, when it's a crisis moment. Uh, we have to connect with the issues that people care about. And we have to also offer something worth caring about. And that takes me to my, to my final lesson, and I'm, I'm putting it a bit mildly, but uh, it really is no fun being called a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer or many of the other things that were thrown around in my campaign. And it's also a real danger to our movements to ignore it, right? It, I think it, it puts us all in collective peril. Um, and I learned a really big lesson around that too, is that you, know, you also have to be prepared for worse than the worst, right? Um, we, we are clear, and I'm pretty clear, that there are barriers to political participation, and they are systemic. You know, as a woman, as a racialized person, as a person of faith, as someone who's relatively young with a history of social activism, I knew I had to work harder and make uh, the strongest case possible for every vote and to not relent on being out there and knocking on doors 14, 16 hours a day. But I really never expected the hate campaign that I experienced and the scale with which I experienced it, especially if for a race like school board trustee. But, you know, we, none of us can deny that we live in a context uh, where at all different levels fear-mongering is happening, where we have global networks uh, that, you know, um, have, are interested in, in, uh, in furthering Islamophobia. And, uh, you know, part of me thinks were we naive to think that our situation was different, that, you know, Toronto, the good, was somehow exempt from that, that global context. And, you know, it kind of also called into question, is, is any place that we are in actually safe from the, the bigger dynamics at play? 
And, uh, you know, we live in a time where, where some people think that Muslim baiting is a norm, where, you know, the contention of the value of black lives or the lives of indigenous women are actually called into question, and where gender inequality is something that we're still fighting for from the ground up. You know, seeing um, Anita's presentation yesterday, it really kind of brought home the fact that, you know, our fight and our struggles absolutely continue. And it can be really insidious stuff, and the purpose of it is to break down the trust that we do build in our communities and amongst each other. And, uh, and that, you know, for younger generations, we need to, you know, not just, uh, you know, protect them from that, but also inoculate against it by the organizing that we do together and activate people to take the action that is necessary. I look at the power of another hashtag, everyday uh, sexism, and for me, it, it drives home a point that we need <clears throat> early warning signs and awareness raising and responses to those, uh, those kinds of systemic forms of discrimination that we are calling out. I think also what's, what's important to remember is that, you know, real hate, whether it's, you know, in person or online, has real psychological and physical and spiritual consequences on people. Um, there are genuine reasons why people are afraid or fearful of getting engaged, of raising their heads and actually seeing what's happening in the world. It takes a toll and we can never forget that as we create our movements to also be supportive and, and aware of that context. And, you know, in this growing culture of fear that, that, is, uh, that is being uh, peddled, we, we might have less and less people who represent the diversity of our society seeking elected representation. In, in my race, the toughest thing that I had to hear uh, was from, you know, a lot of well-meaning folks, supporters, people who also reflected my experience saying, you know, you're, you're strong, but this is why I could never do this, right? And I think that that was the most disheartening and the thing that we absolutely have to be countering is that, you know, I didn't run uh, just to win one seat, but to, you know, pave the way a little bit better and smoother like so many other people before me have. And if we're missing that in the efforts that we make, then, then we have a lot of questions to ask. And it's also to challenge our assumptions about what, what leadership looks like, who is entitled to represent our communities, and, uh, and that to change the model of what progressive political leadership can look like in this country. And I guess just, you know, to wrap it up, politics for me um, is not, not everything, but it is a really crucial piece of the puzzle. So much of what we work on for progressive social change, whether it's a labor movement, whether it's social movements, whether it's, you know, frontline activists on the ground, all kind of culminates at the levels of elected representation. And it really is incumbent on all of us to make sure that we have you know, good people, people who reflect our values in those elected positions. And you know, as someone who has worked in political organizing, I never had any ambitions to run, right? And I think we also have to nurture and ask and to make sure that we are looking to, to what that next generation of leadership will look like. And we also need to make political uh, representation activism and service, something that is aspirational, something that does capture our imag imagination and something that we can get excited about. Um, so I'm convinced that we're on, we're on, we're on a track. I'm, I'm very heartened by everything I saw in my campaign and being in rooms like this, having conversations like the ones we're having. And I know we can keep working and keep succeeding and I'm excited to, to be joining alongside you when we get out there. Chad, as a rapper and, and an artist, do you, are you conscious of, of uh, engaging young people politically and, and, and maybe the, I guess, the, at least the reputation for being apathetic that, that, that comes with that? Um, yeah, there's a little bit of a danger with being too political in music um, right now, the, at least right now, and I don't want to say this is a downward trend. I think it could be just a moment, but I think the climate in music is such that you can't be too political. Uh, everything has to be rooted in the personal for people to receive it. And um, so that's the approach that I learned actually from the artists that inspired me growing up. And one I try to incorporate in my music is to always be personal. Um, a song can be ostensibly political, but really it's, it's personal. Really there's vulnerability there. And the first gesture is, is my own 
opening up my life to somebody. And if there's a political lesson there, then, then there's one there. Um, and I've found that that is just more approachable um, for young people, for everyone, really. Um, the other thing I would, I would say is that there's freedom in that, though, because I don't have to be right um, in the perspective that I offer in my music. There's tremendous freedom, a real privilege in music. I don't have to be right. I feel like young people, when they express themselves through music and through art, they feel like they don't have to be peer-reviewed or, you know, statistically sound, <laughs> you know. Fair enough. It's just uh, no one can argue with your experience, and people resonate with that. Um, and the, the other thing I've always tried to employ in my music is, is humor and levity um, and just trying to show a fuller humanity. So being political, having serious things that I discuss, but also maybe even in the same song, maybe even in the same moment, um, be funny or have fun and, um, and just kind of offer that full humanity and remove some of the weight of some of these serious things, you know, um, race or inequality or oppression. You can talk about these things. You can also dance to these things. You can also joke about these things. Um, and so that's a real gift of music and one I've tried to keep alive in what I do. Um, and yeah, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> David, how does how does the Canadian situation compare to what's what's going on in in Europe? I, I, you know, obviously we're more familiar with what's going on here, but is there are there similar similarities between between what's going on here and what's going on there? Uh, yes, there are there, there's similarities both of problems and of how young people react to it. Um, yeah, sometimes I, I, I'm concerned at the way in which we frame discussions around young people. I, once upon a time, I used to work as a secondary school teacher back in Ireland, where I'm from. Uh, that might be difficult to believe, given my strong Belgian accent. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but, but yeah, at the time I was only 22, and in a sense, I had more in common with my students than, than with my teaching colleagues. But I had a duty to, to my students not to behave as if I was one of them, and, you know, in order to teach them as best I could. But then. Working in a more political and research environment now, I sometimes get the impression that um, political practitioners behave as if there's this sort of teacher-student relationship when it comes to young citizens. Uh, and this comes, this comes with a sense of condescension, of distance, of all these other problems related to that kind of authority relationship. And this is sort of borne out in, in, in surveys like, like the one that David carried out. And we've been doing similar work in Europe with, uh, with the Foundation for European Progressive Studies and a research firm called AudienceNet. And you know, in, in some respect, uh, David's, uh, David's research offered a very, very rich insight into the values of young Canadians. And ours it takes this in the European context and looks also at how these values relate to institutions and to the practice of politics and all of these kind of things. And that's, where, that's proved a very interesting sort of nexus for us. And it, it, through that we found that um, it, you know, it, it, like it raised raise questions about how people relate to politics. You know, a lot of young people in Europe don't feel that they have any kind of meaningful way of, of getting involved. They see parties as cliques run by elites or cartels. You, 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 there are various <laughs> a multiplicity of different criticisms that you can level. And, um, you know, our, our study shows an impression of politics as something practiced by a class apart. And, you know, in a sense, you know, Asma, you, you raised the idea that people are still involved in activism and you know, there's a growth in, in interest in single issue campaigns and this kind of stuff. But at another level, at political and institutional level, worryingly some see a virtue in not being organized. You know, if, a lot of people have paid, given attention to you know, celebrities like Russell Brand who urge people not to bother voting which is an absolute gift to reactionaries and conservatives. Yeah. It, 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 you know. So in a sense, we've, we've kind of um, we've seen a tendency in young European people to, to, to want to be, feel rooted in what they're, in what they're doing. There's a you know, problem of a feeling of powerlessness among them, a lack of proximity to, uh, to politics. Like, you know, recently, it was very interesting to see the huge increase in participation in Scotland during the independence referendum. Now, 
it, it, among young people, it, it went to over 85 or 90 percent. It's, it's crazy. It's unheard of in Europe. And in, in a sense, it shows uh, an interest in it, when people feel that they can be part of the action in something that has a real influence over their lives, they will show interest. But when politics is something just practiced by the chattering classes and commented upon by other chattering classes, it's, um, it, it, it's not particularly interesting or inspiring. Uh, so I, I want to read you one, one quote from, uh, from our survey. It's, by, it's from a young Italian. And it kind of shows the level of powerlessness that people feel in certain places at the moment. Uh, it goes as follows. I've been without a job for three years now, and with it my dream to buy a house. I was living at home at my parents and shelved the idea of getting married and having children because even my partner is not working. At what age will we have children? Never. It will never happen. And right now we are too busy looking for work in order to start a family. And the years pass. It's a very simple aspiration just to get on in life as, as, as their parents did and grandparents and all of that. And so we see that, again, this link, when we split politics from economics and society, we lose this very, uh, we lose this very basic kind of function of, of political life. And you know, in our survey, we found that, say, German, German millennials tended to be quite open and optim optim optimistic about their future. And there are some similarities with Canadian millennials, actually, from reading your survey. But Poles and Italians were much more apprehensive. And ultimately, Part of our function has to be to, to reintroduce this feeling of empowerment. And, and it, it, values alone, it, having progressive values alone won't really get you very far unless there's a, a meaningful platform from which to, to, to act upon them. And that's one of the things that really, really needs to hammer home. It's all very well if, um, if people think like our parties or, or, or like the movements we're involved in. But they don't see the movements as, as genuinely representing them because often we have this kind of tendency when in government to behave as if governance is like a train and even when you change, change driver you can't change direction. This is something that we really need to work on. As a, as a Thank you. For as long as I've covered politics, not that it's been that long, but um, the, the issue of what to do with young voters or what to do about young voters has been there. And as the, the catch-22 is, as I've always been told it is, uh, if young people don't vote, there's no reason for parties to court them. Uh, but if parties don't court them, there's no reason for young people to vote. Um, looking at David's study, it could be read as suggesting a certain amount of faith in, in the ability of government. Uh, but apathy would suggest to me that people don't see anything in, in government, in legislatures, in, in political parties. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, you know, when we talk about hashtags, uh, I wonder whether young voters think that uh, politics needs to be easier than it is. Um, so this is becoming a very complicated question, but um, uh, That's the point. Yeah, we'll fix it all. <laughs> um, the, uh, do, do institutions, governments, legislatures, political parties have to change? And, and secondary to that, do, do young people need to realize that it's not as easy as a, as a hashtag? Um, I'll open the floor. Oh, well, I'll, I'll maybe start off. Um, I mean, we, we, as political scientists, we do lots of surveys of why young people don't vote, and the number one reason is always they don't care. I don't care is always the number one reason. And it perplexes us, we, we don't know why they don't care, right? They, why don't they care? Um, I think one challenge is for uh, progressive uh, political parties, progressive movements, is to give young people reasons to care. I think that's uh, all about talking about issues that are important to them. So uh, I would suggest, I don't have all the answers obviously, uh, though my students sometimes think I do, um, but I, I, would, I would suggest that um, you, know, you have to sort of, I think you're right with the hashtags, kind of sloganizing it, the yes we can, the Obama type of, of, uh, of, of answer is part of that, uh, but also I think you have to talk to issues, like the, and the polling showed that post education was a very important issue for young people. I'm taking a wild bet here, but I don't think post education is gonna be very much discussed this next federal election. So uh, I think it's a combination of, of I think savvy marketing, so to speak like Obama did and talking to their issues. Yeah, I think that some of the challenges of not voting or 
uh, being engaged uh, in politics in a partisan way. You know, maybe it's pr more pronounced in young people, but it's also conversations that I have had with, uh, you know, colleagues that I've worked with or friends at parties, right? Uh, you know, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but, you know, it's all those conversations that start with, like, you know, if I tell them I work in politics or I'm running for political office, oh, well, I'm not political or I don't know anything about politics. It doesn't have anything to do with my life. And, you know, in most people's day-to-day -day lives, it's right fully so, right? They, they, there is a disconnect. There is a piece that is missing there. And those are actually the conversations that I really like, right? Well, it's like, well, what, what are the things that you hope for and want to see in, in your life, right? Is it good health care? Is it, you know, really excellent education for your kids, right? Is it the ability to be able to uh, pursue other job opportunities, to have the supports in your community, public services? These are all people, things that people care about in a practical way. And I think it's about, you know, bridging that gap that you're, you know our lives are political and there is a role and there is a really powerful role for us to play in how that's shaped. I think that's one part of it. I absolutely think that there needs to be a different type of approach and representation in the way that you know po politics as an institution functions. There are a lot of systemic ways and the ways that uh, you know exist in our democratic processes that intentionally try to remove and distance people from the process, right? A lot of the conversations about democratic reform I think are really encouraging. I think when we do change the process, we can engage people in a different way as well. So I don't think it's you know a cut and dry piece. I think from every side, we have to be renewing and reviewing what our efforts are and how we bridge some of those gaps. And some of those conversations are incredibly challenging. A lot of people don't want to don't want to go there. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, young people need to feel inspired um, more than sort of um, issues based, you know, to be empowered to vote. That's all I can, I can really say. I think it has to be on a heart level. They have to feel like there's change. Um, because I think most young people, like I'm struggling to now, can't articulate the change that they want. They can't frame it and, or parcel it out into specific issues. It's just more of a, it's a more vague general sense uh, that has to be sort of inspired, I think. David, is there anything that's worked in Europe? Sorry? Is there anything that, other than having a national referendum on separating, uh, is there anything that's worked in Europe for, for, for grasping you, you young voters? Well, there are, um, there are some initiatives, but we, we do have a lot of problems with Parties that have become overly bureaucratized, and see, a sense when people who are involved in politics talk about re-engaging others in in the process and all that, we tend to forget that we're very much in a minority. Like to, to the vast majority of the population, we're weird. You know, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it, and and you know, sometimes we need that reality check too. It's it, it's not exciting to everybody, but it is to to nerds like us. And, um, <laughs> And, and, that's, and that's fine, but, but, but it is important for people to have a, a feeling of civic engagement and citizenship too. And you know, I find some of the de developments in social media quite exciting in some respects in terms of increasing a sense of proximity at least, um, her feeling of proximity. Obviously there ver there's a very dark side, you know, I went, I went to see Anita Sarkeesian's discussion last night and it's terrifying really. And she's an incredibly brave and impressive person. But, um, it, it, you know, but that is a new platform, and in a sense, the institutions of modern neoliberal democracy were mostly constructed or expanded around the 19th century. Now, you used a metaphor of a train earlier. If you were to give a millennial, you say, "Oh, I'll give you a tra train ticket," you go on a steam engine from from Vancouver to uh, to Ottawa. Like, there's no way they'd accept that. It's just plain strange. But, 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 so that was a technology that was, the steam engine were expanded in the 18th and 19th centuries, and you're never, going to, you're never going to take a train ride on that. But we asked people to engage in politics through institutions that were built back then. It's, you know, so we do need to refresh. You know, these institutions have survived for very good reason, but um, we've allowed them to sort of ossify and to, to become slow and stagnant and, and to reflect the interests of elites. And we see in, in Europe with the growth of, uh, of populism, especially, especially of a radical right character, I tend to see elitism and populism as two sides of the same coin. You, you, one begets the other. 
and we need to be careful about that. And there are significant problems in Europe. Uh, before I ask another 700-word uh, question, um, if anybody has any, any questions in the audience, uh, we'd be happy to take them, obviously. Um, I have a question. Um, my name is Stephen Schreibman. I represent the Canadian Federation of Students and the Council of Canadians that have an application pending before the Superior Court in Ontario to strike down the voter suppression rules that the Harper government just enacted. Our, our, evi our evidence from several experts is that literally tens of thousands of people won't be able to vote in the next election that we're able to vote in the last election. It seems to me, so my question of you is, if you're aware of, you know, carrying on the fight that arose when the Fair Election Act was tabled, it seems to me two things um, need to be uh, understood by people engaged in trying to get young people out to vote. One is to motivate because uh, yeah, these rules are directed and targeted at young people and Aboriginal people and homeless people. Those are the people who will have most difficulty meeting the identification requirements of the Act. So as Obama, I think, his people successfully did in the United States, efforts by the Scott Walkers and the Carl Roves of the world to disenfranchise black people became, was used to motivate people to defeat those efforts and actually get out to vote. So that's one thing that can be done. If we fail, our application for an injunction is going to be heard at the beginning of July, unless there's an early election call. Uh, young people need to know what the rules are for establishing their identity when they go to the polls. You know, getting involved in this case, I realize I never knew what those rules were because I happen to have a driver's license and I get a voter information card and I've lived in the same place for a while. But mobile populations, homeless popula populations, don't have those ID requirements. They're initially put in place by Harper in 2007, and they've been made far more difficult by the amendments put forward by the Fair Elections Act. Let's actually take a, a few questions. Uh, we'll just sort of pile them up, and then I'll ask them all at once. Hi, I'm a millennial, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I'm coming here from Montreal today. Um, and we've heard you all speak a lot about how we need to get uh, young people to the polls. Um, and I think there's also another side of the coin, which is that we need to get old people in the streets with us. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, participating in the organization a bit of the Printemps 2015 movement, which is the new uh, and improved student uh, revolt or whatever <laughs> of uh, 2015. And um, one of the problems we've been having is um, that the unions, because of a bunch of uh, institutional rules, cannot strike with us in the spring. Because of the rules, they have to strike in the fall. Um, and so Tuesday night when we're marching, um, there's 5,000 students, not a single union representative there with us. Um, so I'm wondering if the panelists could allude to how you can sort of reconcile the old left and the new left um, for a stronger movement. We'll take one more. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, I am from a very blue riding uh, in rural uh, Ontario, and I recently joined the NDP and I'm trying to uh, get the Young New Democrats started in this incredibly blue ride. And I think that from a, u a union area where I'm from and from you know, uh, students, fellow, my fellow students growing up with you know, parents who are, in, uh, who are auto workers and so on and so forth, and also growing up and seeing that living in the country doesn't mean people are going to be conserved. They have the information from the internet they didn't before. We, are able to have access to experiences we wouldn't have had before. Uh, I think that it's possible to build uh, progressive movements in places we never thought we could before. But my question is, and I'm trying to focus on people who are my age, how do I connect? Because frankly, I go to school here, I am in the Ottawa bubble, despite being a young student, how do I connect to my own generation? That's, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> uh, all right. 
so we'll do this lightning round style. Uh, so we've got sort of voter registration issues and education uh, reconciling sort of uh, new progressives and, and we'll call them older progressives. Um, and then connecting, you know, even amongst your own generation. Anybody want to want to sort of take on any of those subjects? Um, I, I can quickly speak to the last um, point. Um, I, I feel that challenge, right? I mean, you know, uh, as was alluded to, yeah, we're we are a bit wacky, right, to be in here and to be really excited to devote a weekend to talking about these issues, and that's not necessarily the case with a lot of folks. But we know that these conversations are so important, and this movement building is really important. And I do go back to, you know, some of the really the nuts and bolts of organizing. It's about sharing our stories, meeting people where they're at, and connecting it to those bigger issues and those bigger campaigns that we want to get on board with and I think you know being honest about our stories and why we're coming to things and being able to share that even with a small group of interested or committed people or folks who have that potential is really powerful and that's really how it begins in some of the most unlikely places you know we we talk a lot about the orange wave or some of the successes that we've seen in progressive movements in the last little while that is a lot of building over many years from many different people and you know capturing the uh, the imagination or a moment of inspiration to be able to do that and the more specific and the more honest and the more vulnerable we can be um, with each other sometimes is the seed of how we actually build genuine authentic movements that last and do uh, do see results like like we have in the last little while. They're also ones that need to be nurtured in a very consistent way. I know that's a little bit broad and vague, but I think it really does begin with those individual connections, the sharing of those stories, and actually understanding how we, uh, together, even with a few folks, actually do make a contribution to what that bigger picture is, what that vision is, and what direction we're actually going together. I can, I can take a, a really quick crack at the uh, old versus the, the old left versus new left. Um, you know, I, I think from the polling and everything I've seen, the issues are bit exactly the same. We're very, very similar anyway. I don't think there's a big divide on the left generation in terms of the issues. Where the divide, I think, has been alluded to here is a bit in terms of tactics. And my only advice there, I guess, uh, would be that you know, I guess, old and young people have to listen to each other, have to talk to each other, have to discuss tactics. And I think they have a lot to learn from each other. So I think older people could learn from younger people in terms of tactics, and younger people could learn from older people. In in terms of tactics. So a sort of intergenerational dialogue around t tactics uh, is probably where we're at right now as opposed to some sort of intergenerational, intergenerational debate around issues. Okay, um, yeah, just on, on that point as well, um, you know, the left has always been meant to be about renewal. Um, you know, there's a famous quote from um, Clement Attlee when he was elected Prime Minister of, of, of Great Britain. Uh, so it went, went on to establish you know, universal health care, ed expand education and all of this. But when you asked how did they do it, he said, he said we were about the future, the Tories were about the past. And to a, lot of, uh, to, to a lot of younger activists, the parties have become so, so, so cartel-like in some countries that they don't represent the future anymore. And there's a, there's a gap there in many people's opinions. And there is somewhat of a generational divide as well with, um, I suppose, uh, there's predominantly baby boomer generation in positions of influence as well who, who have, you know, do, have done quite well out of the, those original expansions and those original uh, achievements of the welfare state. In terms of ourselves engaging with other millennials, I guess it helps to have, it helps to have hobbies outside of politics too. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, essentially the idea that we, we constantly renew and we refresh. That's the basis of it. And I guess one, one thing to that point is like, you know, especially when it, well, I think this crosses generations, but we also have to make it fun, right? Like, I think one thing that uh, that we have as progressives is that we have a lot of cool people who are progressive, right? <laughs> Which is pretty awesome. We got some pretty good champions on our side. But, you know, what I've always loved, and especially when I was beginning, you know, my, my student organizing, is that the people who I did it with were really awesome, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And it was hard and relentless work that, that took a very long, like that took a lot out of us but you know we had a lot of laughs and we were in it together and I think that feeling of solidarity in the way that we experience it is so important and that's what I also have loved about the work that I've done in, in progressive political organizing and even in the campaign that I ran we, we we were doing a lot of hard and tough stuff but when we were out there knocking on doors it was something that I absolutely looked 
forward to and the friendships that I was able to, I was able to forge through all of that work I think is what keeps us coming back you know no matter how much technology is out there or how divided things might feel we're all searching for a sense of community right and people who connect with us and I think that that is has been a really powerful legacy of progressive movements is that yeah we know how to have a good time and I think that's a really important quality <laughs> Okay, if we're, if we're good and, and tight with our questions, uh, we can get through these three. Thank you. Uh, I think to do around framing and when I say that I mean I think that as progressives we hesitate to distill our messages down too much uh, in fear that they'll be twisted and um, I fall into that trap too. I hesitate to tweet about things that I actually really care about because what if I don't put enough information in there? And so um, I guess what I'm suggesting is that we have a bit of a gap in how we're framing our politics and we're framing it really well for people who already know what we're talking about um, or are engaged in the issues already. Uh, but I wonder if there are any suggestions for how to start framing the issues and platforms for those who aren't willing to or aren't ready to or don't think they they are you know have the literacy to read at a platform or you know go to a debate or uh, you know get engaged at a level that is only comfortable once you've kind of gone through some of those steps that might have started in the home or elsewhere. Hi, uh, my question is um, I think that. Sometimes when we talk about en political engagement of under 35s, we treat under 35s as this kind of like monolithic block, um, but that's over a decade worth of ability to vote. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have any examples of effective engagement techniques or campaigns that have done a really good job of recognizing that in that demographic you're looking at young parents, young workers, students, and so many people with different concerns that may or may not be the same thing. And someone who's 40 may have some more in common with someone who's 50 than someone who's 20 has with someone who's 30. And so how do we make sure that those campaigns aren't just a oh, I guess we should have a good social media campaign, but actually meet people at the, the issues that they care about in that quite accelerated uh, part of your life where your issues are changing rapidly. So this is not so much a question as like a call out to the people, the public in this room. Uh, there are young people that walk among you guys. I'm uh, just saying, come and talk to us. Please, we're here, okay? Like, we exist, we are involved, and we keep being talked about and not included in the conversation. So come and talk to us, we're here. The volunteers are all, most of them are young people because this is not a super accessible conference either. So please, let's try to make a difference in our milieu to start off with, thank you. So uh, we each have about 140 characters left to respond. So um, uh, David, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, I, I think we have to start thinking about our platforms as 140 characters, as a hashtag. If you can't hashtag your platform, it's probably not going to get out there. So I'd start doing that. Yeah, I think you know, to to the points that were made. We can never see any group or any demographic segment as a monolith, right? There will always be specificities. There will always be differences in experience. And you know, as always, to, we can we can create large trends or big ideas. But it's always about, like the last uh, speaker said, about talking, about having those genuine conversations, about having you know young people, people from all different underrepresented groups, to be part of this conversation. So we have outcomes that do connect with people that are genuine in their efforts and are genuine in the, the asks that we're making to our elected representatives, to who is representing us, and to how we, per, we participate in that progressive conversation. And I think that this is just the beginning of that, and um, I, I hope that we continue to you know, kind of shift the ways that we approach these sorts of uh, opportunities and, and challenges in, in engagement more broadly. Um, yeah, I, I would echo all of that and just add, I mean, if there's anything I can offer from my experience in music, again, it comes down to vulnerability and, and being able to make that first gesture and step out and with something personal and real, and, and that's the bridge to, to the political. So, um, yeah, that's, that's talking to young people in the room, certainly talking to young people outside of the room as well, 
and uh, that's a gesture. That's vulnerability. Uh, just to the last point about talking directly to young people, that was very much the first principle we came at. You know, I'm, I'm a millennium myself, and when we started our, our research, the whole point was to, you know, we're, we're sick and tired of people treating millennials like laboratory experiments. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I, 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 I was quite frankly sick and tired of being told what my generation thinks when my experience has been different. We're not apathetic, we're not disengaged, we just want to engage with systems that work. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah, so, So that's very much where we came from. The whole point is to, is, to, is to have a conversation. We call it the Millennial Dialogue. That's the name of the project. And it is a dialogue. And it, it will remain so. So thank you. Mm. All right. Well, first of all, thanks to you guys. Uh, that was really great. Uh, I had a series of questions about emojis, but we're not going to get to those because I'm being told to wrap up. So uh, thanks to everybody for uh, coming out. It was uh, really enjoyable. Thanks. Thank you to the panelists and uh, to the moderator. Inspiring discussion. And now, for the last time, let's hear it up for our Director of Development, Josh. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. So it is, in fact, my last time here on the stage for the Progress Summit to thank our sponsors. This event would not be possible without the uh, very generous support of our sponsors. Um, I'll start off by saying the plenary sponsors this afternoon, the Ontario Sheet Metal and Roofers Conference and the Sheet Metal Workers Local of 285 uh, helped put the programming together. Our media sponsors for the Progress Summit, Hill Times and iPolitics, as well as the Thai E. Our training was brought to us by the International Association of Firefighters. Our child care was provided by the Power Workers Union. They keep the lights on. And our translation sponsor was the Canadian Real Estate Association. And our coffee breaks by the Canadian Health and Food Association. Our summit sponsors, Summa Strategies, CN Rail, Rogers, Air Canada, the Canadian Building Trades, American Income Life Insurance, Stratcom, Bullfrog Power, WestJet Airlines, Cavaluzzo, the Canadian Labour Congress, Stratcom, MPH, and to wrap everything up, our generous partners, Project X and Media Style. Thank you all very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the programming. Thank you, Josh. And we have one last session, and it will be one of a kind. So I invite you to be all back in here in 15 minutes at 